<laughs> so we are, um, Kelly, I was thinking that maybe like next week's video, I can work with um, Scarlett and do a training lesson with Scarlett. That would be fun. What do you think? I am, you know, I'm, I am exhausted. I haven't hardly slept at all. So do you have any questions <laughs> about the training video that went out this morning? We're talking dogs today, people. Yes. I know something that, um, a comment that was put that Alicia put underneath um, the video was that she mentioned she was surprised or that she would have actually um, rewarded when Chloe was pushing. Oh, hi, there you are. <laughs> when Chloe was pushing the, um, the glove towards me instead of picking it up. And it is super, super important that you only reward the things that you want them to repeat. And since eventually um, the end game on this is that I will drop something, I'll be standing, and she will pick it up and jump on me because she's short and hand me the item. Um, so you really, truly want to make sure that you don't reward things like that pushing because then they'll continue to repeat that and that's not what I want her to do. I want her to pick it up. I want her to hold it in her mouth and then eventually she's going to be jumping on me. So um, we'll start all that in the kneeling position. And with Chloe, you guys are actually seeing basically the fourth time I've worked with her. Um, each video, I'm not working with her during the week because we just don't have time. Sorry, guys. So basically I'm working with her um as i'm videoing the video <laughs> as i'm we're videoing recording the video so um hi colleen um she is a super good dog this is the difference between a dog that's been um clicker trained as a puppy so and she understands the clicker now, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be a puppy, so I probably shouldn't have thrown that in there, but a dog that understands what the clicker means. So once they understand what the clicker means or your yes word, you're marking the behavior, which is what clicker training is about, is you're marking the behavior that you want repeated. Once they understand that concept, they will learn many things very, very quickly. So Chloe's on day four of um, training the pick up command, um, even though it's taken us four weeks because these videos only come out once, uh, once a week. And basically we recorded that Tuesday and, and then it, yeah, yesterday. Yeah. yeah. So it was recorded Tuesday and, um, she did not get worked at all during the week. So she's literally just picking up um, she's only had four training sessions for this. Um, the reason why I'm giving you guys a, a week, hi Mary, um, in between the training is because... Hi Priscilla. Oh, sorry. Hi Priscilla. <laughs> see, I couldn't really see it. Um, is because if you're, um, if you're not marking the right behavior, if your timing is off, then it will take it a little bit longer to um, get the dog to do the actual work. So you have to be, okay, you gotta quit staring at me. <laughs> it feels weird just staring at <laughs> that. <laughs> I'm like, I just see this. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm lo totally lost where I was. <laughs> Hi, Chris, you made it. How are you feeling? How's your shoulder? So, giving you guys a week in between each one of the lessons um, gives you the opportunity to start marking the behavior that you really like. You have that opportunity to mess up in the, in, you know, in the beginning, which pretty much everybody that I work with dogs does, and they kind of mark the wrong behavior and fixing that and then getting the right behavior marked. So um, that's, uh, that's why, why you're getting you know, it's taking longer. Why I'm saying, so work with that this week. And then I also don't want people to move on until their dog is doing a specific type of behavior. 
which is at the, um, <laughs> Kimmy is not clicker trained. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> my anxiety just like went right through the roof. It's actually been a little hard. My anxiety has been up the past couple of days. So, um, uh, Yeah, so I don't want you to move on until the dog is uh, showing the behavior that we end with in the videos. Uh, because what happens is people go too fast and the dogs don't retain the information. And then they uh, don't really learn it, learn the behavior. They'll do it as a trick for a second and then they won't really do it when you need them to do it. So. Even though training this pickup is taking a lot longer um, than uh, some of your expert trainers will say, you can teach a clicker trick in a minute um, very, very quickly. Yes, I could teach Chloe to do this in probably two or three days if I was working with her um, specifically on this and, and working with her every day. Um, but I want her to have it and I want her to, do it, her to do it for real. And I have found that when you go super fast and the dog doesn't retain it, doesn't hold it, and so you don't have a really trained behavior, you have a quick little party trick that they'll do. Um, but as far as working as a service dog, they wouldn't actually do the behavior. So. Um, I'm really hoping that the people that are, are working with these, with their dogs, that are, they are actually using the week and they're doing, um, at minimum once a day, get the dog out and, and work her or him until they're really, truly, repetitively showing that behavior. So now we're going to be working and seeing if she will just completely, uh, repeat that behavior of picking it up and kind of holding it in her mouth and I'm going to ask her to start holding it longer and longer but at first you just want that real pick up and her moving towards okay does the age of the dog matter no it doesn't um when I'm working in when I've worked in rescue I've worked with abused dogs I've worked with older dogs I've worked with puppies I've worked with all the different drives um non-food driven dogs are the hardest uh, because you're rewarding with a treat so if you have a dog that has zero food drive um, you got to get them hungry and then they have to work for their actual dinner so you know luckily the dogs that have really truly high food drives um, work really well and they learn very quickly Chloe will learn stuff very quickly and uh, because she has this very, very high food drive. That dog could be so full and have had all first breakfast and second breakfast and she's still going to do it for a treat. So, um, Justin, on the other hand, he does not have a food drive. So for him, he has to be hungry um, in order for me to work. And we've been building that food drive in him um, throughout his life and now he'll He's at the point now where he will usually just work for the treat um, because we built the food drive. But he was one that would not take treats from you in the beginning. So, but the age does not matter. Food driven is so much more fun to work with because they will just take the treats um, and they'll do whatever it is to get the treat. And that's, that's what you want to be. The, it's really, the hardest dog to train is one that doesn't care about the food and doesn't care about pushing you for the reward. So if you can get them to push you for the reward, they'll keep throwing behaviors at you and eventually one of them will be the behavior that you want. And if your timing is right and you either click it or you give them the yes command, then they'll, they'll, it'll go pretty quick from there. But yeah, it's basically just uh, making sure your timing is good and that they'll work for the food. We do have some dogs that will do it with a toy, like they really, really want the toy. Those are actually not my favorite dogs to work with. Most of your law enforcement work with toy. Um, it's easier to carry on an eight hour shift and whenever you're training in whatever weather. Um, so 
you know, they, they find their drugs or whatever, and then they get the toy. Um, and, and that's a, not my personal favorite because then you have to wait to get the toy away from them in order to get back to your training where with treats they eat it you're giving them a very small amount of food and they eat it and you get immediately get back into training with what you're doing to repeat the behavior over and over and over again i'm food driven also who put that on there priscilla gloria gloria but then she retracted her oh. message <laughs> I, I i personally am very food driven myself does it chew bones or care about toys um, yeah, Justin actually is not, he doesn't chew on bones a lot. He doesn't, um, but he's gotten better. I mean, his eating, he used to take forever to actually eat his food, um, his, his meal. Um, but it just at one point it just started clicking and, um, he started, you know, working a lot more for the treats. I also don't give um, like fake chew bones. I give real bones. So my dogs eat um, the raw meat, raw vegetable diet. So they get, you know, chicken legs with the bone in it. Um, anytime we um, have animals on the farm that are processed, um, I try to keep bone for them so that they have real bone with the real marrow in there. And you can go to a local butcher um, and pick up bags of bone for them that have a lot of marrow in them which is really good for them and it's just it, it causes that drive to chew on bones more so than your uh, fake bones that they make at and that they usually sell at the um, pet stores and stuff like that so any other questions we are absolutely exhausted. We did not sleep well last night, so <laughs> we're kind of like ready for a nap today. <laughs> it's really windy here today. The weather's beautiful, but it's, uh, the temperature's beautiful, but it's really windy. So it's kind of one of those. Um, see, I had a healer that took food out of his bowl and covered it up with the blanket. Yeah. <laughs> I've had dogs do that. Justin hoards things and puts them in his crate and then usually Chloe will and then he'll eat it whenever Chloe acts like she wants it then he'll run over and eat it when it's when he just doesn't want her to have it a lot of times he doesn't want it he just doesn't want her to have it and I have to say that I've built his food drive using her um, having her next to him and him just wanting it because he doesn't want her to have it um, so uh, yeah, that's how I've, one of the ways that I've helped build his uh, food drive. I've had dogs that aren't rescues do that exact same thing. So it's, it's uh, just a behavior that some dogs have. It usually doesn't have anything to do with like abuse or having not been fed or usually dogs that have been starving, they will scarf food down really fast. You had rescues, right? All my dogs have been rescues. Yeah. One of my dogs did the one piece of food out of the bowl at a time. Yeah. And the other one was, he would just scarf. Yeah. So I've seen both. I've seen both that do that. And I've seen dogs that were really, really starved do that one piece at a time thing, which to me blows my mind because I'm like, they were skin and bones. Uh, when they came into the rescue groups, but um, they still just had that, I'm gonna eat it really slow. Chloe's like a cat. Chloe's like a cat. Chloe's like, you get five pets and then stop petting me. <laughs> but she'll do anything for a snack. <laughs> Just Chloe right now is in heat. Um, she is not going to be bred. She's actually going to be spayed here pretty soon. Um, she has a bad elbow. Um, and unfortunately, poor Justin is just having a really hard time with it. And because she's in that space right now. So the they're, they're both uh, just in this crazy space. 
and the female dogs really do go through um, when they go in heat and they're not, you know, not being bred, but they do go through the extremely moodiness. Um, I've had, I've had dogs not want to work. I've had them, you know, things that they always do. They absolutely refuse to do all of those things when they're coming in and out of heat, uh, which is why I always say, if you're not, if you're not going to show and be a breeder and, and do something for breed specific reasons, then you should get them spayed pretty quickly because the um, the uh, emotional things that they go through are just, just like women. Um, as far as she gets really grumpy when she's she'll she'll get real snappy. She'll get um, you know as far as don't touch her belly, don't do any of those things um, when she's going to come into heat. I was hoping to breed her, but because of her bad elbow, she's not going to be bred. So poor Justin is barking and howling. <laughs> that poor guy is not getting any sleep. No, he's not. You had no idea. Yeah, it's not something that people really get. And I'll tell you, more times than not, I've had clients want me to meet them at the dog park. I personally hate dog parks. Hate them. As a dog trainer, hate them. Um, there's a lot of stuff that goes on there and people go and don't actually watch their dogs. And so um, uh, I actually had a Husky come up and grab me by my shoulder and pull me onto the ground. His owner had no idea happened <laughs> that I was standing there training a dog with somebody else. Um, but I've, I've been in dog parks when female dogs are in heat and their owners have no clue that they're literally in uh, breed heat and all of the dogs are going nuts in the dog park and they're like well the dog quit bleeding so i thought she was fine to bring her out i'm like no that's actually when she's ready to get pregnant and i've had that happen multiple times at different dog parks that i've been at with clients i personally don't take my dogs to them are you planning on getting justin fixed probably um just because he's not a uh, breed quality temperament so I don't want to pass that on. I had bought him as a stud dog to be a stud dog um, to start a breeding program with, with corgis and um, he has not, I gave him the time to see if he was gonna turn out and mature into more corgi-like behavior where he is, he is a lot more like a Jack Russell in his temperament. Um, so I don't, think I want to be um, passing that on. So he's probably going to be neutered also. Can you please explain why socialization is important? Well, um, so if you notice, my friend Mary, when P. Roosh was here, he is a um, super sweet dog, super nice dog. And the one thing that she's having problems with him wanting to work. And when he, he gets, when he got here, he was pretty stressed and it took him, what was it, like a, probably 24 hours to calm down a bit here. And then, um, so we didn't want to work here and he didn't, when we went to the park, now to be fair, um, he got close to Chloe's treats and she nailed him. And so he kind of shut down in that aspect but he was already shutting down. It was too much stress um, with the trains going by and the cars and the kids. And um, right there where we work in the, in the park is right where we get water. So there's people driving by and stopping and filling up their big tanks with water. I think you were saying you could see it in the video, this morning's video or yesterday's live, live. yesterday's live in the, in the back. Um, and so there was a lot of stuff going on there. He could not, he was so stressed out, he could not focus. And that's what happens when you don't socialize them. And here's the thing, you can socialize any age of, of a dog. The minute you have the dog, it's a brand, you're imprinting. So your first few months of having a dog is an imprinting stage, no matter what uh, age the dog is. Because when they come to a new person, they learn what they need to do with that person. So 
Um, now, having a super socialized dog as a puppy who's had all the good socialization, you can pass that dog on to another person. Not saying give your dog away, but like I could hand Chloe off to Kim. Kim could take off with her and go cross country and Chloe's gonna do just fine, right? Because she's already had that socialization. Um, the biggest thing that I had with dogs from rescue is they had not been socialized. They'd been brought home, put in a house, and then everything stressed them out. So their person leaving stresses them out and they get anxiety from that. Um, going on just a regular walk, they get anxiety from that. And so then they're not fun to walk, so then they don't get walked and then the anxiety builds and it's this vicious, vicious circle. But the whole point of socializing your dog is teaching your dog how to deal with stress. That is what socialization is, is the basic thing that you're, you're doing at that point. And once your dog understands how to deal with stress, then your dog can pretty much go anywhere and do anything because they've been taught how to deal with stress. So um, if I have a dog that's super reactive, for instance, Justin, he's a very reactive dog. He, any, anything going on around him, he is going to react to it. Um, and what I've worked on teaching him is to work into me. So instead of going, oh, there's something scary over here, I'm going to run. What I work on teaching him is to come focus on me. So let's, let's do something together. Let's work ourselves through it. And he is one that he has a very high prey motivation. So if there's um, running, let's just say running kids, or if we were in a park and they were playing soccer, he would be super reactive to the kids going back and forth. So what I would have to do with him is actually move him away from the field until he's non-reactive. And then we sit there and we let him watch and we let him see. And then we move, you know, five feet closer and we work five feet closer, five feet closer. Sometimes it's five feet closer, three feet back. So you figure out where, where the dog becomes non-reactive and then eventually you can, you're desensitizing him to the things that cause him to be super reactive. So eventually he would be able to get up close to, you know, kids playing soccer on a soccer field. Um, Chloe has never been super reactive to that, but she also has very high prey drive. That's the difference between the two where he is hyper reactive and she is not. And they both had the same socialization as puppies. The one thing that happened to Justin that did not happen to Chloe is um, during his fear stage, Kira scared him really, really bad by scooping him up and picking him up really fast. Um, and it terrified him in that fear stage. And we have been trying to work through that for the rest of his life because, and so there's two major fear stages. You have them between um, about 14 and 16 weeks of age. And then you also have them again at the eight month time frame. So they go through both of them. During that time, I would say, keep your dog at home. Just keep him at home. Don't let any traumatic thing happen to them. Um, I was not watching Kira close enough and couldn't figure out why all of the sudden my puppy started having these weird behaviors and he was overreacting to things like me picking him up and I saw her do it and that was when I was finally able to stop it so um, I know a lot of people uh, get really upset at me because when I have a puppy I am like the puppy Nazi of do not do this to my dog um, because I now for the next 16, 17 years get to deal with what Kira did to Justin as a puppy because it happened during one of his big fear stages. And if something like that happens during those imprinting spaces, um, it sticks with the dog. So, you know, that would be, those would be the time frames that I would say, just keep your dog at home. Don't let traumatic events happen to them. And then, you know, get them back out there and doing the things. Now, a couple questions. Okay. If you have a dog that's let's say older mm -hmm. and they have not had that socialization and they have a lot of fear going out of the house they get stressed out do you start working towards socialization even in, in an older dog yes um, because here's and here's the real reason why we do it uh, 
uh, one, it just makes it a better stable dog. But in the event that something awful was to happen to that dog's person, then that dog either needs to go to a friend or another family member or a rescue organization comes in. And I, I see a lot of that where an older dog, has their owner has passed away and or has gotten really sick and has had to go into the hospital. Um, and that dog, a decision has to be made with that dog. Well, if that dog doesn't know how to deal with stress and and is not socialized, then them going anywhere, they're already upset that their person is gone, right? And that's a real thing, dogs have that. So, and then it has to go somewhere else and it's, and it's just very, very hard on the dogs. So, even the older dogs that I got in, eight, nine-year-old dogs, we would immediately go into socialization. Now, that being said, I'm not going to take a dog that's super stressed out and just, let's go to Home Depot. You know, I'm just not going to do that. You're going to start the desensitization. There's also where you can wrap their body in an ACE bandage, and um, we're going to do a video on this that helps them. It basically hugs them. And, um, and it helps them with loud noises. So if your dog's afraid of fireworks or lightning or, you know, just this kind of hyper stress and anxiety, um, you can wrap that around their body in a way that um, helps them with calming. So, you know, one of the things that I really try to teach is a settle command and it's teaching the dog to release the stress. Very similar to a thunder coat, yes. Other question. But you can do it with a ace bandage. Can you think of other things that have come up during training like you ran today? Uh, can I think of, I don't understand the question. Alicia, can you, uh, yeah, rephrase it? Yeah. Because there's tons of things that can happen. Um, that's why I was, since Kelly's really close to me and she's got a, a large breed puppy that I was thinking of doing a lesson with her dog and us videoing it so that you guys could see. Cause I know there's a lot of confusion with people are like, well, well, can you do that with a big dog? And anything that I do with these corgis, you can do with any breed of dog, literally in a, any breed of dog. Um, so we're going to be working on that. But with an older dog, what I would start doing is, um, walking them in a, um, a neighborhood, not during peak time. So say I get a dog in, right? They're super, super stressed. They have not been had any socialization. Um, we put we put on a, a stress vest or a stress jacket or wrap them with the um, uh, ace bandage. Another thing that I like to do is put one of the harnesses on that have the um, Velcro bags and fill those bags unevenly so one side's heavier than the other and what it does because it pulls on their body it re-triggers the brain right so the brain's not focused on oh I'm super upset it's focused on this thing's pulling on my body right so that's uh, another trick that I've used where I'll put you know a bottle of water on one side and two or three bottles of water on the other side and then we walk through a residential area that's not at peak peak time. So the kids aren't out running around. I don't even know if that happens anymore. <laughs> the kids play outside and, you know, but then I'll work on moving towards peak, peak time, right? So when the kids are out or school buses going through and you have kids running off of school buses or whatever. So I'll slowly work my way to that. And once the dog has become non-reactive to that, and I'll do things like, let's see, we've put, um, I've put collars on that have dangly things on them uh, so that it's, it's this movement and the dog can't focus on the two things at one time. So they will, um, uh, it, it helps get them out of that. I need to be terrified of this thing, right? So, you know, those little tricks or whatever, but if you have an older dog that's really having a hard time with socialization and you're not comfortable with um, reading the dog good enough, then I would highly recommend getting a trainer in your area that can go with you and do this with you and can kind of show you some things that, okay, the dog's reacting this way, so I want you to do this um, kind of thing. 
Another um, question, what's your thoughts on harnesses? When are they good and when are they bad? Um, so harnesses are developed so that the dog can pull without physically injuring the body. So if you have a dog that is a puller, then you would not want to walk them in a harness. Um, I love harnesses for hooking them up in the back seat. Um, so when you're driving and your dog's not bebopping all over the place to, to attach them, you know, to the seat belts. They have the, I have a seat belt leash that actually has the, what, this end. Let's see if I can pull this over here. The clicky. <laughs> the cl this end the in it. <laughs> and it clicks in and so then they have the leash. So I have those. And, and I like doing that with a harness because if, you know, if the, if you have, if you're in a car accident, it, it won't jerk their neck. Um, so those I really like, but, uh, as far as just taking them for a walk, if, if they're, your dog is pulling, if they haven't been trained to heal properly on the leash, um, then I would not use those. I would, um, I would, own, I would use a training collar on those. So Alicia responded, okay. uh, she said, what else can happen? And I think that's her rephrasing it. Can you think of other things that have come up during training like you ran today? What else can happen? Well, um, if your dog just doesn't want to work, um, if they completely don't work, um, you know, if they actually pick it up and, and put it in your lap, then you would be moving forward. So once your dog does a behavior a couple of times, like, her next thing is I'm wanting her to pick it up and try to put it in my lap, right? Or try to push me, my body with it. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna only then start yesing when she does that. Um, if your dog doesn't work, want to work at all, then you need to just, you know, either wait them out. So that's like a big thing. You just wait them out. Um, need to make sure that they're hungry. You can put the peanut butter on, you know, continue doing that stuff. Uh, that we did in week three, which we put the peanut butter on the glove to try and get them to, to start licking it. Um, Pirouche is not wanting to put his mouth around it. So that's with, with him, um, I with a dog that's doing that, I would say you need to make the, this is why I like to use really soft objects. There's two reasons. One, it's not, you're not gonna get any kind of ding on their mouth if they were to open it and try to hit their teeth on it or something like that and that would hurt um, and then they wouldn't want to do it at all so that's why I like soft objects the other thing that you can do and I have had to do this with dogs in the past I have actually taken that object and put uh, like a fish oil tuna fish oil into your your when you're draining all that out put that in there and rub that on the glove so that they're just wanting to snatch that thing up because they, they think it's food and they think it's a super yummy food so you can you know, you can, they'll put it in their mouth and then you can click and treat. So if you have a dog that's absolutely refusing um, cat food, like the, the fish cat food, which is super smelly, um, that definitely is another thing that you can use. Then you want to, you want to make sure you put, keep that in a baggie because then it's going to be smelly <laughs> or wash it. Two more questions. Okay. Any idea why a dog that used to travel great now has extreme anxiety when traveling? So there could have been, um, It's that's actually really funny that you mentioned that because Justin um, has in the truck has high anxiety. He is like, ah, at everything. Um, on my motorcycle, he but he's in the crate, so he go, calms right down, and he knows when he's in the crate, he's supposed to calm down, and he rides just fine. Could that be because of the smaller space? Yeah, it's much more um, comforting to them. Um, so what I would do in that situation is I would do shorter jaunts. You may just do the whole thing of getting all ready and just get in the car, and then sit and have a snack in the car. So, like, don't even leave your driveway. Just give them treats, give them snacks until they completely calm down and then you exit the vehicle. You take them out when they calm. The, the sooner they calm down, the sooner they get out of the vehicle. Um, the mistake that people make that I see a lot of is reinforcing the wrong behavior. So if you get in your car and your dog is high anxiety, right? And they're all over the place and they're bouncing off the walls and doing all those things and you open the door and let them out, you've just rewarded them for um, anxiety behavior. 
So you have to sit back and you have to wait them out and let, and work on that calming. So I use the word settle and I teach a settle very young. So I hold them in my lap, usually on their back because they don't like it and they will struggle. And as soon as they fully relax their body, they're released. And as I'm saying it, I'm just saying settle. And I give soft pets, settle very softly. And as soon as their body relaxes, they get released. What that teaches them is the quicker you settle, the quicker you calm yourself, the quicker you get your freedom back. Now, that then could probably be used, I'm guessing, um, for like during thunderstorms or something yes. like that. Yes. Um, then your dog will know, already know that mm -hmm. that word means just relax. Just relax just the relax. body, exactly. A um, couple more questions. Uh, should you continue to train when you're traveling or when other people, new people are in the household? Yes. If your dog is learning something new and it's too distractive, you just want to move them away from the crazy behavior that's going on. So, you know, say you have a bunch of kids, your kids come home and they bring their friends and there's crazy chaos going in the house. If you can go into another room to where they're just kind of hearing that, um, but eventually you're going to be working your dog in the middle of Home Depot, right? So there's tons of stuff going on in that environment. So um, your dog should work no matter what, no matter what that's going on. When you're first starting to teach them something, the best way to do that is in a room with no distraction. But once they understand it, you want to start adding your distractions so your dog will actually do the work when they need you need them to do the work. How long will a dog retain the training knowledge? Um, that it um. Mm -hmm. There's things the that, you work with yeah, the more it. you work with them, the, the longer they're going to retain you that knowledge. You think about kids that get three months off at, yeah. during the summer and they go back to school, they're stupid because right. they literally <laughs> that was me. Uh, haven't <laughs> had the refreshing. But the, it, that's, and that's the thing, like with Chloe, um, we did retrieve, I did retrieve with Chloe when she was very, very little. She would retrieve and bring things back have not really worked with her on that because that's not something that I need her to do as my service dog, right? Um, the things that I need her to do, she does. She does them on a regular basis. But people with service dogs and like the police dogs and service dog work that, that do actual service work, they train all the time. Um, so uh, people have no idea how much work is behind a service dog. They think, oh, I'm going to get this dog that's already trained. I'm never going to have to do anything with it again. And this dog's going to work for me all the time. That is not the case. Um, you have to do, you have to do reinforcement behavior. And if you think about it, so if I needed Chloe to pick up things, I would be on purpose dropping things around her all the time so that she would be picking them up and handing them to me and then I could treat reward. So I would be reinforcing that behavior. Um, the reason why she hasn't retained her retrieve is because I've just not worked with her on it for five years. <laughs> I mean, really and truly it's been like five years because her first year we did all of the imprinting training. But the key to that is she knows clicker and she can come back to it pretty quickly. Three more questions. Okay. Um, we're having extreme, this is Marie, we're having extreme weather here in the UK. Thunderstorms, any idea how to calm an older Yorkie who gets really stressed? So um, Google creating a um, stress wrap with your dog. So if you have an ace bandage, um, they have some uh, videos on are going to be making a video but right now you're having the weather so you need to know how to do it um they do have some i know they have some videos on how to do it and you just wrap the dog and basically you're you're giving a um a cocoon, a cocoon thank you <laughs> um and it's just a hug it's like a little hug with the ace bandage and it helps um settle that and calm that um, I personally have given dogs Benadryl. I had one dog that would actually self mutilate when she, um, she was a rescue dog, German Shepherd that I had. And she would, she would eat her tail during thunderstorms. So she had to be sedated. And, um, so she would get Benadryl, a couple of Benadryl. Um, but with a Yorkie, they're so tiny. I wouldn't know how much to tell you to get. And a vet will 
can yes. do medicine as mm -hmm. well if you yeah. tell them about it. Yeah. So it took with with Della, she was the one that did that. It, I had her three years before she stopped doing it. And, and we started with sedation. And then we went less and less and less with sedation and more with... Um, I played Beethoven, uh, Thunderstorms to Beethoven when she would eat. And I did that with all of my puppies. And so uh, I would have recorded noises also like firecrackers or whatever. We would record them and then I would play them while they were being fed as puppies so that it would desensitize them to noises and they wouldn't think noises were scary. They would relate the noises to the food. Um, DC0145 says, went to visit my parents. Their dog is 88 pounds, but should be 50. Uh-oh. How do we help them to help her lose weight? Um, exercise and cut the food in half. I personally don't like the diet food. Um, and I had a really long conversation with my vet on this. Um, it's, I would rather give... So I personally, I don't do dog food at all. I do raw meat, raw vegetables. It's called the BARF diet, bones and raw foods um, is the acronym for it. So if you Google that and look that up more, they're getting um, very high quality. There's no fillers in that. Uh, dog food in general has a lot of fillers, which causes our dogs to be obese. So feeding a, um, a, a, the BARF diet, uh, the raw food, bones and raw foods, um, there's not waste. So you're not getting any filler, you're not getting anything that's ca gonna cause them to be fat. And you can regulate the amount of fat that's actually in that uh, particular food. If you don't want to go to something like that, and they also, the other benefit of the raw diet is they have very clean teeth, so they have really good high, dental hygiene. Um, which is something that happens in dogs fed dog food. You either need to be brushing their teeth on a regular basis or uh, give them um, ropes or something like that to chew on to get that plaque off because that's a really big deal thing too that we see that I've seen a lot in dogs that are obese. Why don't they make that for people? A chewy, a, a chewy rope? That keeps your teeth <laughs> clean and shiny and plaques off. <laughs> Um, so I would highly recommend swimming if the dog likes to swim. Justin hates water. <laughs> Justin's my high maintenance dog. Um, so swimming is really good. You have to think about the joints on, on this overweight dog. No, this like is people. not their dog. It's their parents' dog. Right. How do they talk them they, into that? So send them the link <laughs> to this video and I will be the bad guy. <laughs> Um, but really and truly, the best is to get them out to swim. There are a lot of calories are burnt in swimming. Um, it is extremely low impact on their joints. And with that much extra weight on their body, it's just really, really hard on their body. So um, walks, if your parents can't get out and walk them. I'm, I was a neighbor kid that walked everybody's dog. So there will be some child that cannot have a puppy that would like to walk their puppy, I guarantee it. <laughs> um, Alicia says, does it help to exercise the dog first? Is that about before ex before training or? So it depends upon what it is that you're working. Um, if I was doing um, livestock guardian work, I would definitely um, work the dogs, make them exhausted before they go out with the livestock if I'm not wanting them to herd. Um, I personally want my dogs to be high energy when we're training. So if we're, we're I call this trick training, if we're trick training, then, um, you know, if, if you're teaching that, it's best to teach them when they're hyper. And the reason behind this is, when do we want them to behave the best? When, when they're, they're hyper. hyper. So if they're, if they're taught how to rein that in and listen, when they're in a super excited mode, then you'll have a really, really good dog. If you have to take them out every single time and exercise them first and wear that energy off, then they'll never think that they have to behave when they're in high energy. So usually what I do if I'm training a dog, so I have multiple dogs that I'm training, right? They all go under their crates. 
and they, when they come out of their crate, we train first, then they get released in the yard to go play. So, and then usually when I, as they're outside running and playing and being crazy, um, I, in my training facility in Texas, I had a three acre play yard. Then I would pick one dog out of, out of, a ta out of the group Put them on a leash and make them heal make them walk with me make them work make them lie down you know i would call dogs out of that group you know um it would you know chloe come and she would have to come to me and then we would work and then i would release them back into the group and they would get to play and it's because i want those dogs to behave even when they're in a group playing and even when they have super high energy total different story if you're working a young puppy for livestock guardian as in um, Goldshaw Farms situation. That dog needs to be treated. Marie, thank you. That's her grandson's sword that he made oh. at church the other day. <laughs> yeah. He just forgot it in the church. <laughs> um, any other dog questions, dog training questions? We appreciate you guys coming on and yeah. asking all the questions. We've got some new names, so that's been really cool. Yes. Hi, everybody. So welcome, <laughs> Marie and DC0145. Ah. <laughs> nice, guys. Chris, you had a question or a comment that you retracted. Was there something you had a question about? So if I have, so for instance, Justin, who is my high maintenance dog, he is super, super reactive. If I'm teaching him something um brand new right the i'm really going to look for a place that has the least amount of distractions to start that but i'm gonna very quickly try and get him to where there are lots and lots of distractions for him before i move on i think that's the the biggest thing that i see people do um, as a dog trainer, um, they want to move on really quick. And the, the one thing that I see it the, the worst in is the stay command where people will not bomb proof their dogs one step away from their dog. So you, you put your dog in your down stay, let's say, and you take one giant step away from them. You should be able to drop things next to that dog, throw things next to that dog, have a chicken run past that dog. We had a cat that a friend of mine's cat that would literally come and lay in between the front paws of the dogs. Um, he was a Bengal and he was a turkey butt. And he was just like, he'd crawl over them. If your dog cannot do that kind of stay, when you're one step away from them, you have no business moving farther away. Um, you bomb proof them where you can correct them if they move before you ever start adding distance. And it, there's this thing in our brains as humans that say, well, if I can get my dog to stay for five seconds, if I'm 10 feet away, then I've succeeded. And you have not. You've set that dog up to fail and that you will never have a really good stay command. Um, so, you know, don't move on until the dog is really doing what you want them to do at that stage before you add and go to the next stage. Vicki says she doesn't have a dog, so she hasn't commented. Do you have cats you can train on cats? <laughs> Let us know how it works. I have Clifford trained a cat to do agility. <laughs> uh, any ideas how to treat an older pug's dry skin on their nose? Um, so... They have oils for that. The problem is, is they lick constantly. Um, so, you know, putting, uh, I, I would probably put just a little bit of Vaseline on there, on their nose. Um, you don't want to put a lot because it will cause them to have diarrhea. So if your dog ever ingests something, a towel, <laughs> um, any plastic, <laughs> um, anything like that, before you get to your vet, Feed them Vaseline because it slicks everything up and moves everything out. And if you don't have Vaseline, mineral oil works as yes. well. I've done it. I've seen it come out. Yes. It's amazing. So, um, but something like that may stay. Um, I have actually, the they won't lick your, uh, the, um, oh, what's the stuff when you have a cut? The... Um, the dark stuff? No, no, no. It's uh, it's that clear. It 
It's antiseptic neosporin. They won't lick the neosporin as much, but I don't know if I would do that on or the nose neosporin. as much. So um, I would probably say a little bit of Vaseline. Otherwise, your vet may actually have something that's specifically for that. Mary says, during training, praise reward only, does it work or treat also needed? So treat is your fastest. And it's the fastest because they inhale it very quickly. You can immediately get back to training, right? That makes sense. So if you're physically petting them, it that takes away... It takes a minute to get back to the actual training. So as a, as a, I want to cram as much as I can in the five to 10 minutes that I'm working with them at a time. Um, I want to use food instead of praise as far as physical petting praise, right? Um, you'll see me every now and then reach down and pat on, pat on the dogs and be like, oh, that's a good, especially when they do really, really good. They get jackpotted with the food they usually get a pet 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 um i give kisses to my dogs so i'll even go in for kisses and stuff like that um as the big giant jackpot like they've really gone above and beyond like i it has to be very black and white as far as uh-huh okay yeah you did that oh that was good here's your snack okay yep here's your paycheck yep yep here's your paycheck here's your paycheck and then when they do something really big it's like oh wow you did this cool thing and you just got so much better and they know the difference between those two things so three or four pieces of food and a happy face and petting and all of that stuff it's like whoa i really want to repeat that because that got me all of this so alicia that should answer your question which was, can you stop during training to give hugs? Because, yes. <laughs> if you do that and you're teaching something like this pickup command, pick up the object so the dog can't go touch it and you not see it and not reward, them. reward that behavior. So you want to pick up your object first, then make your big deal. Like, you, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure you guys noticed, but in today's video, there were a couple of times that Chloe just kind of went off and did her thing. Like, she was like, I'm going to, I want to roll in the grass. We have nothing but dirt at our house right now, right? And she's like, I love the grass. I want to roll in that. I want to be, and I let her do it. Um, old style training, you didn't let your dog do those kinds of things. You got your dog in where they needed to be. You were healing. You were doing whatever. You were doing a full placement, whatever. Um, and I have, there are dogs that need that kind of training and that is the only way that they're going to learn, right? There are those dogs and they're usually the ones that have zero toy motivation and zero food motivation. Um, it is still doable to teach your dog that method. Um, and you know, there's a possibility that I'll go through and I'll show that method. It's just not the preferred method. They are so much happier and they learn so much faster with your praised based training. But there are those dogs that need the, um, the placement method and then the correction method. Training a food motivated alpha male is so much easier than training a super shy beta. Yes. Uh, Chloe is my alpha and Justin is my beta. <laughs> and it, you're exactly right on that. You're exactly right on that. Um, the other difference with Chloe is Chloe was a single dog all by herself for a while. And that also makes a really big difference. Um, when I had multiple dogs, um, at one point I had 17 dogs and, and that was the total amount that I would keep. And so some of those were being trained to go to service dog homes or in for training as pets. Um, and then also my breeding dogs that I had. And what I would do is I would have dog of the day. And so that particular dog went with me everywhere. Slept in my room that night, went with me in, on all the car rides, was outside when I was outside, was attached to me all day long. Was basically, they did not really go to their crate. And I rotated that so that every dog got to be um, dog of the day. If I had too many dogs, if I, had, if I was full and I had all 17, then it would it would be half of a day so it would be half a day or if i had a couple dogs that did really well together but basically i rotated who got to sleep with me in my room 
up on my bed. <laughs> that way, yeah. So, you know, it, it, it definitely put a lot of work to, um, to it. And then Victor also had his dog of the day. So, you know, otherwise they were rotated out into the yard and then every dog, you know, at, at afternoon or nap time, um, I'd have five or six dogs in my room all taking nap and, you know, so they, I did not have a kennel. So my dogs were not in kennels at all. Um, but they did have crates. Maybe it's a dog crate room. So that makes it, uh, a little bit harder, but I think they learn better when they do that, do it that way. So, okay. Any questions? We have about five minutes left. Dog of the day is a good idea. It makes a huge difference. Um, it's easier mentally for you to just attach the dog to you and that dog's with you all day long. Mary wants to know, can you train a goat or a chicken or a weasel the same as you would a dog? Um, I know that you can train a goat. Not sure about a weasel or a chicken. <laughs> Alicia's questioned that. <laughs> yes, honey, you did ask the you most questions good. today. <laughs> you did good. She gets the question of the day award. <laughs> That's awesome super helpful for other people in the future when they're watching this because it's probably a question that somebody has and this way this will answer that question that's why we're doing this um, so that they can get the answer quickly because we get busy and I can't just stop and answer somebody's question on an email so that makes this real simple yeah. or the reply in the in the comment section takes such a bigger reply <laughs> You can train a dog to make mayonnaise. <laughs> mm, I don't think they're allowed to use that kind of equipment. <laughs> All right, you guys. I think we are headed to nap time because we're both exhausted. <laughs> and let me know in the comments after the video or whatever, any questions that you have or something that you would like to see um, me train one of these dogs to do. Um, and I'm thinking next week, if Kelly's on board, that maybe we'll get together this week sometime and do a lesson with Scarlett, because she's a really cool dog. We do have a question for you guys. Would you guys like to have a dog training live? Oh, yep, we talked about that too, that's right. Yeah, so let yeah. us know what you think. Because, Drop yeah, it in the comments. we could absolutely do uh, training lessons live. So. As long as the weather's good. Um, or we could do it as a premiere where we can be in the right. comments answering um, while the video's going. Yeah, the, I, the hard part with premiere, though, is trying to type out a long response. response. Gotcha. Got you that. So, sign me up. All right, <laughs> Kelly's on board. So, sometime this week, we're going to do a lesson with Scarlett. Wait till you guys see her. She's super, super cool. If you have not seen her, she's on Kelly's channel a lot. So, um, but so we're going to do a lesson with her. Kelly, how old is she? She is a Akita, a female Akita. And I think she's what, six months old? That's right. Seven months old. So. <laughs> I'm Kelly. Yes, we know you're Kelly. Yes, Kelly, we know. What did I say? Dog? <laughs> nine months. Nine. Okay, nine months. <laughs> <laughs> so a nine-month-old female Akita. We'll do a lesson with her. And uh, basically, Kelly, just come to me with the things that you want to work on the most and uh, what problems that you're having with her. And we'll, we'll discuss in detail on those and we'll just do a video of that. So I guess that's pretty much it. And we're going to take off. Thanks guys. Bye. Everyone have a great afternoon, afternoon, yeah. nap 